We are back for the Thousand Worlds Book Club, and we're talking about Dying of the Light, or at least the first five chapters. The link to the written and the audio is below. Dying of the Light is George R. Martin's first novel, and while many other stories take place in this Thousand Worlds universe, this is really the first one that has the time to breathe and explore the richness of it. In fact, Dying of the Light is actually pretty light on plot. It's generally just about a guy who visits his ex-girlfriend, offends some space hunters, and then has to run away from them. But the plot is really secondary to the setting and the feelings. The whole book is astoundingly rich, so much so that I'm going to be passing over a lot. So let's start with the title. Dying of the Light comes from the Dylan Thomas poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. The next line being, Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light. And the story is about death. The death of a planet, the death of love, the death of culture, the death of people. But rather than death just being a melancholy withering, it's about the violent emotions and fight against the inevitability of death. The planet, the loves, and the cultures of this story are all doomed, but there is rage and resistance in their dying. So the prologue describes the setting of the story, the planet Warlorn a rogue planet that passes by a freak star formation called the Hell Crown that makes the planet temporarily habitable. And so the neighboring worlds held an enormous festival to observe the Hell Crown. But that was years ago. The festival is long over, and the planet is drifting away from its star into interstellar space. Of course, the sadness of a dead festival planet is reused in A Dance with Dragons with Kro Yane, the dead festival city. And Warlorn rhymes with Forlorn, which means abandoned or lonely. Anyway, once again, we're dealing with unusual orbits, like in Bitter Blooms and the Plague Star, and possibly Ice and Fire. And once again, we have a theme of a dying Earth, like in In the House of the Worm. This once again shows the enormous influence that Jack Vance had on George R. R. Martin. In the prologue, we hear quite a few names from the Thousand Worlds lore, including Celia Marcian, Claren Amas, and Tomo and Wahlberg. We've heard these names quite a few times now, but most notably in Bitter Blooms. Claren Amas will be very important in The Glass Flower. Now in chapter one of our story, we're introduced to our protagonist, Dirk Talarian, another heartbroken sad sack. He is remarkably similar to Johnny from This Tower of Ashes. Now Dirk is sent in the mail a whisper jewel that contains the memory of his ex-girlfriend Gwen. We ran into the idea of a stored memory being an echo of consciousness in Night Flyers, and this is going to be a major thing later on in The Glass Flower. As in Night Flyers, George R. R. Martin loves to write about the idea that memories are ghosts, whether it be their literally disembodied consciousness or simply metaphorical echoes of past times. For example, the Stark children are literally putting their disembodied consciousness, that is their ghosts, into their direwolves. But at the same time, Mira and Kyburn talk about the memory of people being ghosts more metaphorically. And then there's the literal storage of memory and consciousness in things like the Werewood Net or the Heart of the House of the Undying, and with these whispered jewels and memory crystals. Anyway, with the arrival of this jewel, Dirk remembers that he and his ex had promised to come to one another if this jewel was sent. And so Dirk hops a ship and spends a few months getting to the edge of the galaxy at Warlorn to find his ex-girlfriend, Gwen. Of course, with the talk of promises, it's tough not to think about Ned and his promises. And this reunion with an ex at the edge of the world or galaxy is of course very similar to this Tower of Ashes and Ned's mysterious trip to Starfall to see Ashara Dane. Now when Dirk remembers his ex-girlfriend, Gwen, he remembers her as Guinevere or Jenny. Guinevere is, of course, the wife of King Arthur that was stuck in a love triangle with him and Lancelot. And this is another story about love triangles. But Lady Guinevere is also a male-oriented idealization of women, and this story is very much about the tendency for some men to put women on pedestals and imagine them as things they aren't. And with the shortening to Jenny, we are reminded of Jenny of Old Stones, a person that Littlefinger wanted Kat so desperately to be. So Dirk arrives on Warlorn and is greeted quite awkwardly by Gwen and by her co-worker Arkin Rourke. And Dirk finds out he's going to be staying with Arkin rather than Gwen. It's worth noting that Arkin has the classic super blonde Targaryen hair that our author loves to include in his stories. Anyway, Arkin is from the planet Kimdis, a planet of pacifists in the Fringe, and the three start talking about the culture of High Cavalon, the planet that governs Warlorn. The Cavalar are a violent, sexist, racist, xenophobic people, and they are broken into holdfasts, which are essentially houses. The culture is remarkably medieval, or Westerosi, 
And yet to Dirk's surprise, Gwen is now weirdly linked to them through a sort of marriage to a man named Jan Iron Jade Vickery. Interestingly, in this conversation, Arkin talks about half-truths being the worst, most dishonest lies. Of course, in Ice and Fire, we hear about the best lies being mixed with truth. Now back during the festival, all the outer worlds built cities on Warlorn, and Dirk, Gwen, and Arkin head to the Cavalar city of Lartain, which is built into a mountain much like Casterly Rock. And of course, so much of Westeros is subterranean. In our second chapter, Dirk wakes up and heads outside to find shirtless Jan, who turns out to be a rather civilized guy because he spent time on Avalon. They talk a bit about history and harangans before Jan sort of threatens Dirk by telling him he exists, and then Jan gives Dirk a friendship pin with the symbol of the Iron Jade Holdfast. The two then head in for breakfast and meet Jan's life partner, Gars. Essentially, Jan, Gars, and Gwen are in a sort of triple marriage. Jan and Gars are Tanes, while Gwen is Bethane, though we find out later it's more complicated than that. The relationship between Gars and Jan is almost identical to that of John Connington and Rhaegar. Gars looks exactly like John Con and is more traditional, while Jan was a sullen, isolated youth who later picked up fighting and wants to reform his people. Anyway, the crew starts talking about concepts like altered men and not men. Altered men are genetically altered humans, much like Stumblecat from Star Lady. The variants that exist on Prometheus could cover every creature in Ice and Fire. Not men are people with genetic stock that have strayed so far that they have trouble breeding. I think of the others and their need to steal children with this. The crew also talks about the Banshees of High Cavalon, which seem to have a telepathic bond to those of the Iron Jade Gathering, much like direwolves do to Starks. Banshees have been introduced to Warlorn in hopes that they would thrive, but they haven't really. Anyway, because Gwen is an ecologist, she decides to show Dirk the planet a little. They ride on some sky scooters, and then Dirk hits on Gwen. She denies him and tells him that the problem with their relationship was that he kept calling her Jenny. Jenny wasn't her, but an idea that Dirk had in his head, and she felt herself drifting towards his ideal. With the naming issue, we kind of get into Aristotle's idea of there being both substance and essence to an object. And the existentialist Sartre believed existence precedes essence. You can't have the shadow of an object without the object. Gwen and the Cavalar seem to be turning this on its head and saying that essence can precede or even cause existence. And this all relates to the discussion of body and ghost as well. If we're turning Sartre around, essence, that is a ghost, can be there without existence, that is a body. Immediately after this metaphysical discussion on names, Gwen and Dirk enter a dying forest and observe choker trees that smother other trees and remain long after the others have died. And they note a skin shell of a tree spook that he left behind. They are essentially observing remnants, ghosts, essence without existence, names without bodies, heartbreak without love. Dirk gets really depressed, so they head home. In the third chapter, Dirk makes it home and talks to Arkin, who turns everything on its head. No, Gwen is not happily married to Jan. Bethane does not mean wife, but property. If Jan dies, she becomes Garces. And if Gars dies, she becomes a breeding cow for the Holdfast. And if Jan loses a duel, she passes to the winner of that duel. Arkin describes Gwen's life as a nightmare. Arkin also mentions that there's no word for love in Cavalon and muses whether they have love without a name for it. Essence and existence again. Of course, sci-fi stories often show a caricature of our world to make a point. Is Cavalar marriage any different from traditional marriage? Are people made into property? My wife and my husband. Are they trapped in a marriage? Are they considered damaged or worthless without the marriage? These were big issues during the sexual revolution in America, and George R. R. Martin is very much of that time. This story is from nearly 40 years ago, but still some of these issues remain. Anyway, the next day, Dirk comes to breakfast and finds Jan in an argument with a man named Lorimar Braith. Lorimar has a grievance with Jan and leaves in a huff, and Dirk then asks what's up. Jan then goes into a long history of High Cavalon. Jan explains that the High Cavalon have a long history of myth 
that involves the coming of fire and demons and the need to live underground. But Janus discovered through research at Avalon that High Cavalon was once an advanced civilization, but then regressed because it too was part of the Double War and fell into an interregnum. The coming of fire was nuclear war, and the demons were really harangue and slave races and the need to stay underground was because of radiation, and nuclear war regressed the Cavalar to being technologically primitive and becoming a savage, holdfast-oriented people. It's worth noting that the Harangan slave races do resemble giants, the Haroon, giant bats, dactyloids, and the children of the forest, Githyanki soulsucks. And it's worth noting that Westeros is also very subterranean, especially Casterly Rock and Winterfell. And Westeros has certainly regressed technologically, is house-oriented, and perhaps experienced a nuclear winter. Anyway, Dirk says, so what? And Jan explains that there's a fourth demon in Cavalar myth, the Mockman. The Mockmen were human mutations with special abilities, wares, shape changers. And these Mockmen were hunted down and skinned. This sounds remarkably similar to the relationship between the Boltons and the Starks. The point of the long story on Kevlar history was that religious extremists like Lorimar and other Braiths believe that all non kavalar are mockmen and can be hunted. Lorimar had seen Dirk the day before and wanted to shoot him down, but Dirk had Jan's pin on him, which marked him as Iron Jade property. Thus, he was saved. In truth, Jan and Garce had been giving out pins to try to save everyone on Warlorn from being hunted and to avoid political embarrassment for High Cavalon. Dirk is quite insulted at being given a pin. He doesn't want to be Jan's property, even if it is for benevolent and protective reasons. So Dirk gives the pin back. This, of course, relates to apologies for slavery from back in the day that argued that slavery was good because it was benevolent and protective. Even if slavery had been that, it wasn't, but even if it had been, benevolent and protective ownership of another human being is still ownership of another human being, and wrong. And our author also seems to be making a statement about patriarchy, and perhaps even a statement on marriage itself. Although some might consider the male sexist dominion over women benevolent and protective, it's still ownership, and still wrong. We are once again back at the words, my Jenny. Anyway, in the fourth chapter, Gwen and Dirk continue their tourism. The two head to the city that the Kimdisi built, which is now completely empty, and called Twelfth Dream. The language and themes that George R. Martin uses to describe Twelfth Dream are remarkably similar to that of Crow Yane in A Dance with Dragons. Overgrown gardens, black vines, whispering dead, remembering laughter in the streets, the death of beauty and thoughts of a past relationship. The two then move on to the city of Muskel by the Sea, which sounds remarkably like marine in its looks. We have multicolored bricks with domed buildings. It's windswept and dusty. The people that built it, though, were the Lost Folk, an odd forgotten colony of primitive fishermen. This group had clearly lost or given up their technology even before the Interregnum. The two then move on to the city of Challenge, which is remarkably like the city of Old Valyria, but with giant fusion-powered towers instead of geothermal ones. Challenge was built by the people of I Emeril, I standing for after interregnum, and the I Emerali love to show off their technology. The whole city is run by a computer, and Gwen and Dirk have a fancy lunch that's composed of animals all the way from Jameson's world. Dirk and Gwen then start talking about Gwen's relationship with Jan, and we find out that Arkin's assessment was somewhat correct. Gwen is having trouble with Cavalar culture and with Garce, but she's also suffering from the same problem with Jan as she had with Dirk. She is Jan's Bethane, and she finds herself being forced into a role and identity that she thinks is not really her. Now along this theme in Ice and Fire, we have several examples of the wayward brides. That is, women who run from a marriage that they feel trapped in, like Asha or Jane Poole or Alice Karstark or Lyanna. Anyway, the two argue about whether they should get back together a bit before heading to the next city, Crine Lamia. With its towers and canals, the city is a bit like Bravos, and like Bravos, the city is obsessed with death. Crine Lamia was built by the Darklings of Dark Dawn, the outermost planet of the galaxy, which is filled with a bunch of depressed nihilists. The city constantly plays a depressing, beautiful symphony of Lamia Bailis, a name you may remember from Bitterblooms, and the symphony would drive people to suicide. Of course, Darkling of Dark Dawn is quite similar to Darklin of Duskendale, and Darkling is almost certainly a reference to the Thomas Hardy poem, The Darkling Thrush, which is more or less about a dead, wintry environment with one bird chirping in it. 
The theme of the poem is rather close to the idea of do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. It is the fight and resistance against death. I will say that Gwen and Dirk's discussion in the city of Crine Lamia is essentially the theme of the entire book, and perhaps is the theme of all of George R. Martin's work. Isolation, death, ghosts, existentialism, ecology, being trapped in the memory of the past, breakups, rage, it's all there. And quite notably, the city's music production is rumored to be controlled by Lamia Bayliss's mind itself. We once again have song being compared to consciousness, something we saw in Guardians, and we will see again in A Song for Leah. Anyway, weirdly, we actually find out that Gwen wanted to live in this depressing city as it represents everything in her life. And Dirk suddenly becomes angry at the idea of nihilism, the world may be pointless and doomed and sad, but the whole point of everything is how we act faced against death and nothingness. That is, after all, what life is on a fundamental level. Struggling and fighting to stay alive violently against the inevitability of death. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Gwen is half convinced and thinks about getting back together with Dirk. In the fifth chapter, Dirk and Gwen make it home and Dirk heads to bed. He listens through the walls as Garst, Jan, and Gwen argue. He also hears a thud as if someone was hit. Dirk also reads Jan's thesis on the history of High Cavalon. It turns out that the deep sexism that the Cavalar have originated from a female-targeted disease dropped by the Harangans. Women were quarantined, but because there were so few, women became communal holdfast property. They remained locked up so they could be used sexually by men of the holdfast and to keep them from getting stolen by men of other holdfasts. Women of other holdfasts became highly prized because of the genetic diversity they contained. Of course, stealing women for their genetic diversity is a practice we see with the wildlings, and literally locking women up for sexual reasons appears in Ice and Fire with the Maiden Vault and perhaps with the Tower of Joy. Anyway, Dirk wakes up in the morning and finds Gwen and Jan gone. He is troubled by this and thinks Gwen is being kept from him. So Dirk goes to talk to Garce. Garce curtly tells Dirk that Gwen is off working. The two men talk for a while and Garce talks about his bond with Jan and how Jan was a weak, awkward boy, but Garce helped him learn to fight by attacking him often. We also find out that one of Jan's heroes was an Aaron High Glowstone. Aaron armed his women, treated them as equals, and let them fight too, though his holdfast was destroyed. It may be that House Aaron is in reference to this Aaron Glowstone. Garce also talks about how Cavalar culture is dying due to space flight and the mingling of other cultures. Anyway, the unfriendly conversation with Garce leaves Dirk even more panicked to find Gwen. So after Garce leaves, Dirk goes out to find a car. He does find a car in the parking lot and thinks about stealing it when its Braith owners, Breton and Chell, return. Breton has half a face, much like the Hound. The two capture Dirk and must wait for Jan's return. And that is the first five chapters of Dying of the Light. We will talk about chapters 6 through 11 in part 2. See you then.